This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Farman Crane. We're here today with Carsten Stöcker. I've known Carsten for, uh, for quite a long time. He's, uh, he's been a podcast listener for a long time. He reached out to me, I don't know when it was, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago or something, when uh, he came to Berlin and we met up with him. And uh, it was amazing because he was so excited about blockchain. He had so many ideas, uh, so many uh, things he wanted to pursue. And so he's today, he's a senior manager and an evangelist for machine economy innovation uh, lighthouse at the uh, energy se innovation hub uh, which is quite a job title uh is that really your job title oh yes um it's, it's it's my job title yeah so basically what's very nice about the job title is that um it resonates very well with the media because it's pretty much in contrast to the utilities we know from the past where utilities are basically silo-oriented, very conservative, not moving at all, no innovation. And now we have this extreme job title, machine economy evangelist. Um, that's quite a contrast for very old industry. Yeah, no, that definitely sounds like it. And yeah, so Carson also has a PhD in physics and he was previously um, Accenture for a long time. And then he's also part of the, the World Economic Forum. They have this... Uh, Global Future Council, uh, where he's he's a part of, uh, and uh, and yeah, so thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, just to give some background, the company you work for is called Energy, uh, but before you were working for uh, RWE, do you mind sharing a bit about you know what what is RWE, what is Energy? You know what kind of company is it, so pe people can uh, picture a little bit. Uh, you know, kind of where you're coming from. So RWE um, or the old RWE is um, was a utility, an integrated utility, and uh, utilities typically have upstream, basically where they do mining of coal, of oil, of gas, and um, of fuels. They can burn in their power plants, and um, so RWE has lignite or coal-fired power plants and nuclear power plants and of course the old RLE before it split had um, a little bit renewable business it has a grid business grid business is a regulated business which is due to the fact that um, utility business or the grid business is a natural monopoly and this um, brings a lot of kind of questions how to set a price for a grid customer for example so it's um, mon natural monopoly it's a regulated business so it's um, upstream power generation, renewable grid, um, commodity trading, basically um, buying fuels that can be burned and selling the energy that's being produced on the wholesale markets. And last but not need uh, a retail division to um, yeah, sell the energy to b business to business or B2C customers. For our U.S. listeners, uh, you know, just to sort of put in the context, our WE is sort of the historical German utility company yeah. yeah and basically in germany we have the energy transition and um, part of the energy transition is that the utilities are obliged to turn off their nuclear power plants so in addition because in principle there's no space to burn fossil fuels anymore on this planet and for that reason in germany there's also pressure kind of to think about um, um, the fact that we're burning fossil fuels in our coal-fired power plants or gas-fired power plants. And now there's also political first discussions um, yeah, to regulate. Um, so what's the lifetime of the um, coal-fired power plants? Um, can we reduce it? Can we reduce the CO2 emissions? And that basically led to the decision in RWE to split it into two parts. So one part is the nuclear power plant business, the coal-fired power plant business, and the commodity trading. That's now in RWE. And now the new part is called energy. That's basically renewable business, grid business, basically distributing energy to the customer's home and retail. So that, that sounds a little bit like they took all the parts that are like headaches and off the past and, you know, 
difficult to put it in one thing and then now energy is sort of the company for the futures. Is that about right? Yeah, absolutely. So basically the uh, story for the um, investor community is also now the investors have two portfolios and they can choose whether they would like to invest in a company that's producing energy or if they would like to invest in a company, the new energy that basically has a renewable portfolio, the grid and the retail customers more future oriented. Absolutely. So our, uh, energy is also the grid operator in Germany. Yeah, so um, the grid business is different in different countries. And in Germany, it's very inhomogeneous. I think we have around 700 different grid operators. Most of them are very small on a municipality level. And so energy is the biggest grid operator here in Germany. And we have um, 8 million customers, which is for Germany quite a bit. And we are operating yeah, a huge part of the distribution grid. That's really that's really interesting because uh, so I'm I'm in France and here in France there is sort of one uh, grid operator and they have this sort of de facto monopoly on the grid and metering uh, aspects of energy distribution. I wasn't aware that Germany had so many grid operators. Yeah, that's 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 a key difference among all the different countries. And what's also nice from a business model perspective because the grid business is pretty much regulated, which means it's a cost plus, you can say it's a cost plus model. A regulator comes in, measures the costs, allows the um, utility to put a margin on top of it. And then the, the sum of cost plus margin, that's basically the baseline to devise the, the, the prices for the grid customers. And yeah, that's regulated business and you can kind of um, work around with the costs. And of course, if there's a lot of pressure, a lot of different grid operators in your benchmarks. And um, yeah, that's, that's what you have here in Germany, also some competitive pressure, even if the grid business is a regulated business. RWE, I, I think, or m maybe uh, tell me how exactly that works, but uh, my understanding is it has about 70,000 employees. So are, are those now in energy mostly, or are those still mostly in, in the old R R R RWE? So right now, um, the majority of the employees are in energy. And um, as I mentioned the grid. So we have a field force, for example, to maintain the grid, to um, operate the grid, to deploy new grid infrastructure. And there's, there's a huge field force there. And um, yeah, the rest is then in the old RLV. I think we can say, um, I don't know the exact numbers. Maybe it's around 30,000 um, in, in the old RLV and a bit less than 40,000 in the in energy. Okay. And so how did you hear about blockchain? How did you become interested in blockchain? And how was it, you know, working with this topic in, in the context of, you know, a very old traditional company, but a company that's at the same time is going through a tremendous amount of change and uh, disruption of, uh, of its, you know, business model and of its existence really as well. Basically, the idea was to invent the Uber for energy. Everyone wants to have the Uber for something. So one of our board members in the Netherlands said, I would like to invent the Uber for energy. He basically asked um, Mark Dijksman. Um, at this time, he was a freelancer working for our Dutch business to come up with an idea how to do the Uber for energy. And Mark basically said, yes, I can do this. And he posted, because he believes in open innovation and collaborative approaches to innovation, he posted on LinkedIn. So who can help me to um, come up with an Uber for energy? And then there was another guy, Joris Bontje, and he mm. was basically part of the more kind of the extended Ethereum Go ecosystem in Amsterdam. And he proposed to do it via smart contracts and have a look in um, yeah, a proposition doing peer-to-peer -peer energy trading on the blockchain. And um, yeah, this is basically how we um, came to the topic of blockchain, a little bit by coincidence. So one guy at, at RWE in Holland was kind of given a task, created Uber for energy. He found some Yoris, uh, who, yeah, who I know a little bit as well. And then, and then how did that, did you become interested in that point as well, when they kind of, that, this idea came up, RWE is going to create the Uber of energy using blockchain. And he said, like, okay, what, what is that? Or what, what's your personal story with this? So basically, I engaged with the team. Um, I was curious to learn about um, energy, blockchain, and um, yeah, 
these kind of propositions. And um, at the beginning, I worked with with with, with Joris to put some um, ideas into place. So how can it work? Yeah. So what does it mean if I have a smart meter and connect it to the blockchain? So what does it mean in terms of transactions? In terms of um, uh, putting a peer-to-peer -peer, um, trading engine in place on the blockchain, and we basically worked from a technical perspective, how can such an architecture work? So in addition, of course, we also looked at the kind of business model implications, because in the end, so peer-to-peer um, -peer energy trading is not new. Um, so in a couple of countries, and even in the US, we have co-ops, energy cooperatives, or we have smaller energy kind of um, entities. And um, I think it's very natural if we have a co-op, a cooperative, where people kind of trade energy among each other, or they're buying energy on bulk um, for themselves, or selling energy to a wholesale market. Basically, it's pretty much straightforward um, to think about putting this on the blockchain. And this was basically our project, what we have done together, um, coming up with a tank solution and some um, the process and business model solutions, how to do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading on the blockchain. And what's very interesting to understand, because in the end, I can do my peer-to-peer -peer energy trading yeah, among a couple of people um, yeah, that are close to each other. Uh, on the other hand, I need to aggregate what the people are doing. That's called building a balance group. And the balance group is basically a simple sum over time, saying that's the energy being produced. Um, by a peer community, that's the energy being consumed. And as a delta, I have even a time series for a delta, that's called a schedule. And of course, there's either uh, excess energy I can sell on the wholesale market, or there's a gap in energy that I need to buy from the wholesale market. And especially this aggregation is where a peer-to-peer -peer community um, doing trading on the blockchain needs to intersect with the real world because suddenly they have to um, yeah, send schedules to a grid operator or to buy or sell energy to a wholesale market. And that's pretty interesting because then you can think about what's the role of a utility in this type of world. It's basically a world in transition where I have decentralized kind of peer communities doing energy trading and a world where I have existing um, players in the um, energy business, such as wholesale and grid. And basically, in this world, there needs to be an aggregator that's aggregating the, uh, the energy consumed and produced, and basically acting as the interface to um, yeah, wholesale markets into the grid. And this is basically a role of a utility um, that's coming on top of the peer-to-peer um, -peer energy trading. It's a very slim, lean role, because it's basically making sure we have a legal entity um, around the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading community. And in addition, so we can serve and fulfill um, existing processes to interact with um, yeah, wholesale market participants. Cool. Well, that's uh, there's a lot there. And we already kind of went into one of, one of the topics we wanted to, to dive into, which is the, the energy trading. But maybe before we go a little bit deeper there, uh, let's, let's kind of stay on, that, on a high level first. You know, blockchain and, and some of those new ideas in the context of, you know, old company changing rapidly. So first of all, innovation is a term that, you know, people are always uh, so interested in, right? They're tr trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, I was, you know, in, in here in Berlin, I would get contacted quite often from uh, this kind of bizarre thing. I mean, it's kind of bizarre, kind of interesting where you have like, some old school company that's sending like 15 of their ex executive to go to like Berlin on an innovation trip, right? Where they meet like, like five different companies and like, it's almost like a school trip, you know? So I think the term innovation, right? And, and this, this concept is such a big topic, but so how, how do you actually do it? Like how does one actually change uh, and, and get innovation into an um, established company? So there is a little bit of a story to explain before, because our CEO, Peter Therium, he made a decision first to do cost cutting, second to run a huge change program across the whole group. And in this change program, this was basically bottom, bottom up and top down, the, uh, the top 300 managers, the middle management, and even ordinary employees. A lot of them participate in the change program. 
because many corporates have a couple of systemic issues. And the systemic issues are silo thinking, power distance control, hierarchy. And if you have the systemic issues, there is no chance at all to come up with innovation from inside a company. So um, that's the reason why Peter Tillium first did the cost cutting, the change program. And after this was done, he launched the innovation program. And in innovation, we have a couple of um, operating principles. And one is, so we are looking for business models, business model innovation. So we are working with external partners, external networks. Um, we would like to do it fast by applying a lot of innovation methodologies such as lean startup, design thinking, and we, we, we put our teams in scarcity to come up with solutions, um, with, with, with rapid prototyping very fast to test it with customers. That's the other principle that we're always testing stuff with customers. It's customer centric. We always have the customer in mind. And the last principle is that we have focused topics. We don't do everything because the innovation world is very yeah, like Alice in Wonderland. You can do a lot of interesting stuff. And in the fo focus topics, we have smart connected. So smart connected homes, smart connected cars. Then the next focus topic is digital disruption. Um, that's the idea of all kinds of digital business models that change the, um, yeah, the energy landscape. Then we have big data, of course, um, to do have data-driven insights on the retail side for new business models, but also to improve the effectiveness of operations, for example, in fields such as predictive maintenance. And then we have something very interesting. It's called urban solutions because utilities are in the center of cities. And the center of the cities, let's say they operate the grid, then they have infrastructure connecting every household. They even know every household customer. They know the bottlenecks, they know the um, decision makers, the government bodies, they know the local infrastructure. And that puts utilities in a very nice um, sweet spot to understand the local needs of the community and to come up with solutions and innovative um, yeah, business models to address the needs especially when all the technology around us is changing with drones, drones, taxis, and fleet of autonomous cars, and um, sensors everywhere, and LoRa. So a lot of opportunities um, for yeah, business model innovation um, in the city. Last but not least, we establish a lighthouse called Machine Economy. And this is where I'm working. And in the Machine Economy, we are looking into propositions that are um, taking into consideration that we see machines as future customers, that we see that there are transactions among machines, that there are machine-to-machine -machine transactions. Um, it's a lot about IoT. It's a lot about physical delivery. The utility business is a very physical business, which means we deliver energy, we deliver logistics, we produce stuff. And um, yeah, so that's our main focus in the machine economy. And now you can say, okay, it's just let's say IoT, machines, IT, we are not looking into any central solution because we, we know there are a lot of people and big corporates pushing central solutions forward, such as GE with Predix and uh, systems from Bosch, from BMW, everyone comes up with central solutions. And our thinking is that we only combine IoT machines with decentralized platforms because, um, yeah, there's a lot of space to come up with new solutions, business models, and that's our, our main um, thinking there. And we are looking at a couple of industries. It's, of course, energy, it's mobility, and it's manufacturing supply chain. And yeah, that's uh, interesting to see that and sort of encouraging to see that uh, within your organization, there, there has been really that organizational shift from the top down and from the bottom up, as you said, uh, because... You know, I, I when, when when I talk to large corporates, um, uh, it could be in the energy space or you know, like uh, in any, any type of industry. Uh, a lot of times, what what we see is innovation departments really interested in you know CIOs really interested in this type of new technology and the and the prospects that uh, and the sort of new use cases and, and, and disruption that they can bring. Uh, but then what happens is. Well, what sometimes happens is um, you're then stuck after do doing some sort of experimentation with that innovation department, trying to sell that innovation or trying to sell that project to uh, an industry line within that company. 
uh, if the I think that you know if if the the the, the company itself um, is uh, sort of organizationally set up so the innovation and uh, and you know the sort of lean startup and and uh, that you mentioned approach um, is is really integral to the organization then we can really start getting innovation at all levels. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's really that's really interesting and, and, and encouraging to see that uh, a, a historical player like RWE can rethink itself, you know, 120 odd years after its uh, you know, after its creation. You know, companies in the past were um, built on this idea of accumulating power and accumulating monopolies, and that was certainly the case, and certainly is sort of the case still for a lot of traditional utility companies in in European countries. Um, you know, if we start building decentralized platforms and uh, really taking away their their central monopolistic power, um, that really goes against uh, their their business models and the interests of their shareholders. Um, what do you think that this evolution uh, towards decentralized platforms uh, means for a company like RWE uh, and Energy? Yeah, first of all, of course, the um, decentralization is disrupting our existing business models, for example, especially in the retail business. On the other hand, um, so we can come up with new business models that can extend our current retail business portfolio. Um, so if we look into kind of the um, business economics of decentralized platforms, so our thinking is that it will be um, zero marginal. So we don't believe um, that you, or I personally don't believe that you can make a decent margin from base transactions. I mean, people are using a decentralized platform for energy, mobility, or other industries. So if there are transactions and let's say a corporate or consortium are operating the platform, I don't believe that the consortium um, can take huge margins um, to grow a decent big business. And that's, that's a kind of challenge. Just on that, I think that's an extremely interesting point. So I, I would love to say a bit on that. Can you explain why you think you think that's the case? So I personally think because decentralized platforms are built upon distributed ownership, which means everyone can join a platform, everyone can contribute to it. And um, if then let's say a small consortium is trying to dominate an industry, a in principle it can be possible. But I personally think if someone is trying to, to dominate an industry, then the consortium will be replaced by someone else who is much more open. I think my view would be whether you are right or not is going to depend a lot on kind of the network effects and how, you know, how stable are these consortiums, right? Because if you have one and it's in place and, well, you have to use that one, well, they should probably be able to use... Uh, you know, charge a, a big, a decent amount of transaction fees, and you know, if then RWE owns twenty percent of the consortium or something, right? Then well, they can maybe make a big margin. But if it's easy for them to say, well, we're just going to spin up another chain, and and that one's going to charge a third as much, and so now people switch to that, um, yeah, then then you might have this drive towards a, a zero transaction fee environment. And what, what I think is especially interesting is that kind of translates over to the public blockchain space as well, right? When, when you have something like, let's say, uh, Ethereum, you know, there's a question if, if Ethereum keeps improving with the technology at a rapid rate and it can handle way, way, way more transactions and then the transaction fees collapse, right? At, at a faster rate, maybe that then even demand increases maybe there's not so, so much of a case that you, you say that, you know, the Ether price is going to increase a lot because Ethereum is a success, right? You could have the case that Ethereum is a big success. A lot of applications run on top of Ethereum. People use Ethereum. But that doesn't mean that Ethereum looked at as a sort of a business actually was a success. Do you, would you agree with that kind of direction of thinking? So I first agree that um, yeah, blockchain is software. So if someone would like to introduce um, transaction fees, I think there will be someone else um, doing a different version of the software, reducing the transaction fees. And that's what we say, it's a race to zero. So 
we are pretty sure there will be other players who would use transaction fees, transaction margins. And it's probably similar to Google search. Google search is for free. And that's the reason why I personally expect that um, transactions on the blockchain will be almost for free um, in the long term. Um, in terms of the consortia, um, I think today a couple of consortiums are considering, let's say, um, an ICO, consortium ICO. It's maybe just a thought experiment. No one has done it. A couple of consortia are thinking about gas, um, yeah, making revenues and margins via gas. And a couple of them are also looking into putting transaction margins into smart contracts. But if, if we just reconsider that blockchain is software, it can be easily copied. Someone else can, can be able to reduce the transaction margins. And that's the reason why we think it's a race to zero. And our, at least my conclusion is, if it's a race to zero, then there will be almost no monetization at the core of a decentralized platform. So that's what we call, we have monetization at the edges of the decentralized platform. For example, system integration um, revenues to integrate existing infrastructure into a blockchain or value added services um, to basically aggregate assets to, to drive a value out of this or even personalization services. If someone has a personal need, I probably have to understand the need on an algorithmic level. I need to connect it with um, yeah, transactions on the blockchains, with assets, with um, offers. And basically, I can monetize. Um, yeah, this personalized service and that's kind of an extreme in terms of the blockchain that people can expect um, there will be zero uh, monetization potential at the core but there will be monetization potential at the edge of the platform okay so if, if i summarize then what what you're saying is that no longer do these monopolistic um historical actors uh, will, will they be able to monetize the networks themselves? Uh, the networks become sort of a public commodity that anybody can use, uh, that anyone can use for basically free. And then you open up those networks uh, to competition for creating value-added services at the edges. And something like a blockchain enables for those, for the you know, for that uh, ecosystem to build those applications on top of that existing network layer. Yeah, that's a very nice summary of um, the hypotheses I have. Yeah, and just to kind of re-emphasize that point, which I think is a very interesting point, and I think it's a very, uh, it's a very good perspective that's underexplored. I mean, I don't think we really explored that perspective. I think the same thing, if it's true for consortium blockchains, I think the same thing is going to be true for public blockchains too. Yeah, so, so yes, absolutely, because I think consortium blockchain for me, it's a little bit of a transition. So today we have public blockchains. If you would like to put scaled transactions on them, they're too slow. They don't scale right now. There are also some privacy issues. That's the reason why I expect, of course, there will be consortium change for industry-specific use cases and domains. And um, on the other hand, um, so this consortium chain needs to open to get all the network effects and the um, innovation on top of it. And in the end, they will be transformed in a kind of public blockchain again. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. I suppose Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more. Keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys. They're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux. You can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone. You can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. 
and more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. So uh, looking at this business model uh, thing from another angle, um, you mentioned before you're also part of the, the World Economic Forum and uh, you, you, you put it that a, a big topic there is ethics and governance and, right? and, and all the change that's coming with the disruption with blockchain, AI, etc. You know, that's going to destroy tons of jobs. How do you think about this problematic? Is it a topic at, uh, at energy? And, and what's, what are your personal views? Yeah, first of all, it's a topic of, at energy because we would like to be responsible leaders um, to take um, also the disadvantages of new technologies into consideration and um, yeah, to make sure we are good corporate citizen. So in addition, we are pretty much engaged in the World Economic Forum. And that's also worth to mention the Global Future Council of the World Economic Forum when I was there last time in Dubai last year. Uh, 700 people attended the Global Future Council. And there are a couple of, um, let's say, technology councils. It's blockchain, AI, 3D printing, drones, future of computing, quantum computing, crispr cars, space technology, biotechnology, you name it. In addition, there are a couple of people looking into more the kind of the bigger societal problems, such as human migration or um, development in Africa, in Asia. And in the end, um, I think it was a shared belief of all the people in Dubai when we la met last time is that all the technologies at the tipping point right now, there's a huge tsunami um, yeah, approaching us, approaching our societies. And um, there are a lot of benefits, but of course, a lot of risks. And for the risks, no one has an answer. And regardless of blockchain, it was a consistent theme that everyone was asking for and even crying for governance, for ethics, for standards to take to make sure that the technology is not harming our society. So it's providing um, or helping for the good of society. And on the other hand, you can even say some of the initiatives of um, World Economic Forum to um, establish responsible leadership to take care about the impact of jobs, society, the um, digital divide and um, human migration, all this kind of stuff. But I think the reality is that we have Trump, Erdogan, May, um, yeah, Putin and a couple of other leaders. And with those leaders in charge, it's impossible to solve the governance and ethics issues today, which means in the end, everyone then um, draws a conclusion, okay, it's America first, it's my my home country first, it's my, my company first, which means people start kind of um, yeah, looking for their own to monetize stuff and um, to um, benefit from all the, the, the big technology changes that are coming soon. And um, I don't see any kind of um, huge group pushing forward real solutions to sort out all the risks for our societies. And that's, yeah, that's a little bit the challenge. And we could have a whole, a whole discussion, a whole show about that, uh, that whole you know, bag of worms. Um, so let's then move on to uh, some more, uh, some more uh, uh, interesting topics. Uh, so yeah, so um, let let's let's take the conversation then to uh, blockchain and energy. There's a lot of hype around this. Um, I was telling Brian earlier. It seems like. Every couple of weeks, there's another conference, there's another end of event uh, talking about blockchain and energy and uh, people describing all of the use cases that are possible with uh, um, the uh, joining of these two types of technologies. And um, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion around use cases. Uh, we're talking about smart grids. We're talking about mobility. We're talking about um, traceability in energy credits, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, but you know, not a lot of experimentations yet. There have been some, uh, and you know, you'll talk to us about one of those. Uh, but so far, you know, about a handful of POCs and sort of pilot programs uh, that have any, you know, sort of any 
value uh, um, at a at scale. So could you first let's before we go into that, um, perhaps you know describe what an energy grid looks like, um, a traditional energy grid, and then contrast that with sort of where we're going and this idea of smart grids. So tra traditional energy grid is consisting um, of huge power plants, coal-fired, nuclear-fired, hydroelectric power plants. And then we have a transmission system operator. That's basically a high voltage grid to transport energy over long distances. Um, so in addition, so we have a distribution system operator that's basically distributing the energy in a city to the different households. And yeah, then we have the consumers consuming energy. And there's one element missing from a technical perspective. There's also a grid control center. And that has a very important task because the grid control center is making sure that the energy that's consumed by the households or by the businesses is exactly the same amount of energy that's fed into the energy system so that there is a real-time balance um, of energy being fed into the system and energy being consumed. And the grid control center is basically controlling frequency, which means, for example, in Europe, we have a frequency of 50 hertz, and they are making sure that the frequency is stable in the grid. And on the distribution system operator side, the distribution system operator, they have some leverages to, um, to control the voltage level um, to make sure that we're in a specific range of, of the voltage level. And that's very interesting because in the end, what we need in the energy market is um, yeah, what we call flexibility or balancing services. So if, for example, the consumption changes then we, the grid control center has to react to the changes and either reduce energy is fed in the system or increases the energy. So that's being all done in real time. And now when it comes to, um, first of all, to more renewables in the energy grid, we have to understand that renewables are extremely volatile because if there are clouds um, that are hiding the sun, um, or, or shielding the sun a bit from the solar cells. This has an immediate impact on um, yeah, the energy that's fed in by the solar cells. Or if the, the wind um, flow um, is, or wind energy is changing, then our wind turbines are feeding less energy in the grid. And there's huge volatility. And the extreme is what we call in Germany, and that's, that's even a term that's used elsewhere as well, Dunkelflaute, which means if it's at night and there's no wind, then the renewables, at least solar and wind, they don't produce any energy for the grid. And in, to make sure that we still have enough energy um, yeah, to power the consumption, we need flexibilities or balancing services. So we are kind of um, controlling real time the big power plants or, and that's what the grid operators are looking into. They're looking to find flexibilities in local grids which means basically, are there any batteries? Are there any cold storages? Because in the cold storage, I can uh, introduce a lot of energy to cool to deeper temperature. Or um, I can, let's say, um, feed in less energy and then the temperature is going up a little bit, but at least I have some flexibility to play around and to take care about um, yeah, fluctuations or volatilities in the grid. And um, then, of course, we have more and more renewables, solar cell on the rooftops, um, um, some biomass and combined heat and power, a lot of decentralized assets that are not controlled by a central control center. And this is very difficult for the grid operator. And for that reason, grid operators are really, really looking to get hold of flexibilities and to use them to stabilize the grid. And of course, when we think about a more decentralized grid, there's an immediate connection to what um, the blockchain is. It's a decentralized technology. And that's the reason why people like to connect the decentralized blockchain technology with, yeah, with, with decentralized energy assets and to think about all kinds of business models such as peer-to-peer -peer trading, such as um, local flexibility markets um, yeah, to take benefit or to take advantage um, yeah, of, of the blockchain and use it for these types of business models. When I think of the blockchain in a smart energy grid, you know, I, I look at, uh, if, if I were to contrast the two, like on the 
traditional grid side, it's very top down. So you, you know, you have coal fired power plants, you have nuclear power plants, you, you know, have different, uh, maybe hydro and those uh, different energy sources are feeding energy down uh, into, into the grid in a very sort of hierarchical, you know, uh, top-down approach. Um, with a smart grid, it's the, the configuration of the grid itself, forget the blockchain, but the configuration of the grid itself is much more decentralized. So, you know, you have these sort of, you know, massive uh, sort of traditional uh, you know, uh, energy production means like the coal-fired power plants, the nuclear, the hydro, whatever. Uh, but then you also have some solar arrays that are being operated by um smaller companies or you may have some solar arrays or some uh, uh, wind turbines being operated by a, a local community and and those are feeding energy into the grid as well and if you take the two one thing that's definitely missing there it, because we have all this IOT and all these devices being connected into the grid uh, is is a means for data to be flowing um, in real time. And the traditional grid doesn't have any of that. I mean, the proof is that when you, when you go, when, when you, uh, about every month or every three months, you know, someone has to come to your house and like look at, you know, the meter. Uh, whereas with the smart grid, we have an opportunity there to implement blockchain technologies that would allow for real time data to flow, uh, in, uh, uh between, you know, all of these different, devices and 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 um, energy providers do, do you agree that with this idea that the blockchain sort of provides the 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 data and transaction layer that is needed for this new type of grid to exist so that that's exactly how we phrase it at well we call the base the, the blockchain as the transaction layer for the future energy system um, which means we can do physical transactions to send energy from A to B, but at the same point in time, we can do the financial transaction. And of course, if the transactions are getting smaller, smaller and smaller, we need a technology that um, yeah, can do all the settlement and billing. And that's a big hope and the big dream of many people when they look into energy and blockchain, um, that this can be um, yeah, delivered by a decentralized platform. So, so earlier I, I, I sort of talked about this, uh, all this hype around uh, around blockchains and energy, and there seems to be a lot of interest, uh, especially from sort of traditional energy grid providers and the tr traditional actors. At least that's the that's the that's the uh, the view that I have here in France, and obviously it's it's true in Germany as well. Um, why do you think that? There's so much enthusiasm uh, around these technologies, in your opinion. And where did all this come from? Like, where, where, where was the sort of pivotal moment where all the CIOs at like the you know, traditional energy utility companies said, oh, blockchains are, are the wave for the future uh, uh, of our industry? So for me personally, this is one of the big questions, Mark, I have, because... Um, of course, a lot of people looked into fintech innovation with blockchain. And then for me, the big next wave was that people started looking into energy and blockchain. And um, there are around 90 startups that are looking into propositions, energy and blockchain. And um, a couple of people counted use cases. People counted around 200 different use cases for energy and blockchain. It's a pretty well-researched uh, field. A lot of POCs have been done. And my personal conclusion is why people immediately jumped from fintech to energy, or a lot of them, is because I think in Bitcoin, we are burning a lot of energy. Yeah? And then what does it mean? It means, okay, Bitcoin is equivalent. It's an equivalent to energy. It's an equivalent to, to money. That's a very nice connection. And then people immediately draw the conclusion there must be value in combining blockchain and energy. And of course, the other conclusion is what we just discussed, that's a lot of decentralized um, assets, bottom up, solar, um, uh, wind, biomass. And of course, there must also be value to establish the transaction layer. And that's, that's the reason why people jumped on this. I think um, there was an event, Horizon event in Vienna. And um, I have not been there, but I talked with a couple of people. Unfortunately, I couldn't go. But I talked with a couple of people and they said, yes, there's huge momentum, huge interest in the topic energy and blockchain. However, uh, almost no one has a business model. 
And that's a kind of challenge because there's not a technology penetration that allows to do all the nice things in terms of the smart meters that are being deployed. In many countries, there are no smart meters or the wrong smart meters. In terms of solar, batteries, um, it's just not deployed. It's regulation and the economics because today I get more money if I uh, sell my energy to so-called feed-in tariff or under the power purchase agreement because it's subsidized. And um, there's less money you make selling it to your neighbor, the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading idea, for example. Um, and that's a kind of challenge. And that was the reason why we started to looking beyond energy, um, because I mentioned, okay, we're interested in physical delivery and blockchain. That's the reason why we're pretty much looking into other industries, supply chain, mobility. And that's also the reason why we started immediately with electric vehicle charging, because that's something where we think it's um, an energy-related um, use case. It's even going in mobility, and it's possible today. Because today we have very few charging poles, we have very few electric vehicles, we, and we have a standard. So there's a global standard. It's the ISO 151108 standard. It's very nice because in blockchain land, a couple of people are, are crying for standards. And as electric vehicle charging, we have a standard. And this standard is a perfect fit to what we think um, yeah, is an electric vehicle charging transaction on the blockchain. And yeah, the key conclusion we drove, it's doable. Um, there's a standard and there's even a business model. Why shouldn't we go on the electric vehicle charging? Um, yeah, that, that's what we're currently pushing forward. What are you guys actually building when it comes to electric vehicle charging? Basically, we, we worked with, or we're still working with Locket. And it's, it's pretty simple because we can think about sharing economy. You would like to share assets, assets such as a charging pole. And then you think about, okay, what is, um, what is Locket doing? They have the smart lock. They're opening, closing a smart lock. So what's happening in the charging pole? Basically, we're switching on and switching off um, electric, an electrical connection. It's pretty similar. And it's the reason why um, we gave Slocket a call and asked them if we can deploy their, yeah, their smart lock POC into our charging pole, plus to, to extend the technology, the functionality by reading out a meter and then doing the billing and settlement of the electric vehicle charging transaction on the blockchain. In the end, it's pretty easy. You have an app, you basically locate a charging pole, you go to the charging pole, you um, take the ID of the charging pole, you send a transaction to a smart contract, uh, a transaction, for example, with a deposit, then the smart contract sees, okay, there's money, and even the charging pole sees there's money, which means um, as a deposit in the smart contract, which means the, smart, the charging pole can trust that's being paid. And of course, the electric vehicle or the, the driver can also trust because the charging pole doesn't deliver. Um, yeah, it gets get back the deposit, which is very nice. So we basically have a notary grade transaction on the Ethereum blockchain for electric vehicle charging. And of course, you can think about putting a peer-to-peer -peer node on a Ethereum client, on other blockchain client in every charging pole. That's quite a mess, a lot of work. And um, what we are right now building, one of the systems we call share and charge. And we are collaborating with a lot of other charge pole providers, especially in Europe. Um, big ones, um, but also in, um, in North America. And the basic idea is um, to connect a backend system with the blockchain, which means we can put in one sweep entire fleets of charging poles on the blockchain. And it's pretty easy because if you look in the traditional architecture of charging poles, um, let's say I have 1,000 charging poles. They are connected via a machine-to-machine -machine communication network to a central gateway in the data center. And in traditional systems, they are coming commercial applications on top of the um, communication gateway. And what we are basically doing, we are connecting the communication gateway to the blockchain. And by yeah, establishing this connection, we, we basically have in one sweep the entire pole of charging po uh, the entire fleet of charging poles um, yeah, on our decentralized platform. And we are right now really pushing forward to get um, an installed base in place, which means we're doing a couple of MOUs, a couple of further proof of concepts with people who have relevant assets. And uh, we start with charging poles, but also we're looking into parking lots and all this kind of stuff. Because in the end, 
So when we have mobility transactions on the blockchain, when we even have a wallet, a blockchain wallet in a car, then of course we can think about um, providing additional transaction services such as toll collection, parking, insurance, um, yeah, and other things. And that's kind of the more longer term vision to establish a decentralized platform that can handle mobility transactions. That's what we're pushing forward. And we start with um, charging and we start with getting an installed base as soon as possible in place. However, we are also aware of um, privacy issues and scalability issues. For that reason, we are looking to get the installed base in place, but to release the product um, only to few um, selected extreme users so that we can, yeah, that we have control and um, in terms of yeah, scalability issues, private issues with a small customer group and that we are not kind of yeah, uh, putting too much pressure on the system, but we get all the learnings. And it's not only about the installed base and the technology. So we are also um, concerned about the user experience. And that's the reason why we are pushing forward to kind of to hide the blockchain, to hide the crypto tokens, to offer to offer euro tokens. So we're basically also um, implementing a, implementing a payment gateway, which means we are transferring euro into crypto euro or euro token. Uh, we are doing this and yeah, of course, then we have to deal with a couple of legal and uh, financial regulatory issues. But in the end, our key objective is to have a system that's working end to end, that's hiding the blockchain, providing good end user experience, automating all the um, underlying processes. And that's basically demonstrating that's working for an ordinary customer. And of course, then the next step would be to, um, yeah, to address the the other remaining issues that everyone has in terms of scalability and um, and privacy, but we would like to sync it with the technology advancements in the blockchain field um, yeah, that, that we are all foreseeing in the next months. Because when, you, when you're talking about this, you're talking about uh, this running on public Ethereum. Yeah. yeah. So right now we, we, did, we, did a, we did a choice to, to start with public Ethereum first um, to demonstrate that's working. However, if we, so we, I think connecting installed base to public Ethereum is easy, um, but then scaling the users and putting transactions on the, on, on the blockchain and also taking care about the privacy issues is a little bit more difficult. Um, for that reason, we're starting with a smaller group of, um, we call it extreme users, but um, we're, also, we're also working on a kind of the next version of the, of the, of the architecture to take um, into account that we need to scale it as well. So um, on a high level, when do you think as a user, we, you know, normal people are going to be using some of these things, you know, in normal transactions, how far out is that? What do you think are the first things that are going to happen? Yeah, in terms of electric vehicle charging, we are offering the solution to normal users. Yeah, so this will happen pretty fast. However, it's not. Okay, so if I have an electric car, I can I can download that app, and I can use it today. Yeah, not today. In the next eight weeks, that's our objective, and so we're basically having an app. Uh, we are connecting the app to our payment gateway. You can you can load your basically. We're also providing a wallet. You can load your wallet with your credit card, your bank account, or whatever it is. Basically, you transfer euro and then you get crypto euros. And with the crypto euros, you can do the transactions. Oh, wow. That's, and that's going to be rolled out in Germany first. So if I uh, now all I need is to buy a Tesla or something, and then uh, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah we, call it a little, we, we, we call it a soft launch because we're not naive in terms of all the kind of technical limitations we have. So our strategy is to put as many assets on the blockchain to demonstrate it's working and of course also to demonstrate that we have critical mass because if you have 10 charging poles on the blockchain, there's no point in it. Uh, and yeah, so we would like to, we are, we're working on getting the installed base. We're connecting our own backend to the blockchain, which means in one sweep, we bring uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 charge poles um, to the blockchain. And on the other hand, as I said, so we have a bit, little bit of conservative approach, what we call soft launch, in terms of um, rolling it out to um, a limited number of users. Yeah. So we, we talked about some of the limitations uh, that we may face um, 
in implementing these technologies. And I think using something like Ethereum uh, is, is a good idea for experimentation. But in the future, I think we mentioned earlier that we may want to move towards some permission sort of public consortium style blockchains. And one of the reasons there is, you know, obviously for confidentiality, privacy, that kind of thing. There's some, there's some other limitations that uh, I'd, I'd like you to address. One, one of the major problems or sort of limitations that we face when we're thinking about connecting different grids together uh, is this idea of you know, being able to uh, tr- properly trace electrons. And so the, the way that I understand it, I mean, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but the way that it's being explained to me is you, know, you may be able to tra- trace a payment or a token on a blockchain, but if you're producing energy on a smart grid um, through a, uh, a solar cell, and then you're relying on the traditional energy grid to uh, supply energy when you're in low production, the, the grid doesn't make the differentiation between so that local green energy and the energy being provided by the grid. So could you explain to us then, perhaps in better terms, uh, how uh, this pro- problem is actually being dealt with or how you know people thinking about this may want to solve that problem um, if we are to have sort of this decentralized system with you know, blockchains managing energy credits uh, and, and multiple sources of energy coming into our energy grids. Yeah, I think we are very early stages. So people start thinking about it. They would like to combine, of course, blockchain with AI, with decentralized um, yeah, systems that con- control energy, let's say, in a cell. And um, it's uh, a little bit futuristic, but what people are doing, they're thinking about digital grid routers. That's Professor Abe from University of Tokyo. And with the grid, digital grid routers, you can basically say, um, I can take an electron. I can even say, okay, I would like to send the electron from, or the electrons, the energy from A to B. And via a decentral system, I'm managing that only when I'm sending from A, that only B is consuming the energy. And um, of course, then you need to, to track it, you need to settle it, to bill it. And that's the idea that blockchain and this future digital grid technology can all do this on a decentral level. Um, there are some technical ways to self-regulate the system. Let's say there's a lot of renewable energy flowing in the system. Then there are flexibilities in the systems immediately reacting and um, yeah, making sure more energy is consumed or stored in a battery, for example. And so when we have all this kind of self-regulating grid cells, then of course, decentralized technology can immediately real-time automate it um, to do all the kind of yeah, financial transactions to make sure people are being paid that dedicate the assets um, to a decentralized grid or digital grid router solution. Cool. I, I had no idea that uh, these types of technologies existed or were being were being researched. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's what I would like to add. That's a very, very cool thing because today we can send IP packages via routers from, from IP address A to B. And with these types of technologies, we can send energy from A to B. And um, this is very nice because today... We, there's a physical flow of energy and a commercial flow. And today, commercial and physical flow, they're completely separated. And um, so with this type of technology, we can bring commercial and physical flow um, in sync again. And also, if we think about what does it mean for fintech innovations, when I can send energy from A to B in almost real time, I store it at B, which that also means I can send money from A to B because there's an equivalence um, between energy and money. And that's um, yeah another new kind of topic um, that's, that people can consider. Yeah, because one, one of the, 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 the problems when you're dealing with a sort of traditional grid and the smart grid, so let's say on one hand, like you have, okay, let, let's look. Let's take this example, like you have a household, that household is consuming energy from multiple sources. It's consuming energy from like the solar panel on its, on, a, you know, some local businesses rooftop. And it's also consuming energy from say a coal fire power plant. And 
the, those different sources of energy have different costs, and perhaps the government is incentivizing the inhabitants to use to better like make better use of their energy so that they're only using that solar energy and and not uh, you know not the coal fire power plants and there may be other incentive mechanisms and you know once once you start there's no way of differentiating what's a green electron and what's a you know like a dirty electron uh and and that's that's where it starts getting blurry for me is how how do we differentiate those and how can like yeah, the, the blockchain itself doesn't solve this problem, um, but it seems like these other technologies might be. No, it, 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 it helps to solve the problem because if I know that behind a smart meter that's measuring the energy that's being injected, there's a coal-fired power plant or let's say a solar cell, then I can um, tax the energy. Basically, if at, at my house um, I have a solar cell, I'm feeding energy in the grid, then the energy that's fed into the grid um, at my house and I have a smart meter data, I basically can put a renewable energy certificate on the blockchain that's telling that my, my household via the smart meter delivered energy in the grid. And by the way, this energy package was a green package because um, yeah, the blockchain knows because there's a registration uh, means in place that the energy of my smart meter is green and the energy of another meter is, let's say, brown. Um, and then people can start differentiating this. And in the end, it can mean that my energy is more um, valuable than, than other energy because it's green and I have the renewable energy certificate. You also mentioned another very important topic um, from energy perspective, that is uh, locality. Because today, businesses who can prove their local community, they, have, they are green, they are using green energy, can now do this with the local renewable energy certificate. And one of the business models in, um, in energy we are looking into is combining people who have, let's say, solar cells with a business that has a complementary load profile. And the business in this case can mm. be a supermarket because in summer when the sun is shining and solar cells are producing energy, we need a lot of energy to cool down um, yeah, the, the cold storage in the supermarket. And of course, in winter or during night, when there's no sun, we need less energy. So it's a little bit complementary, which means we can connect the power generation of local solar cell house owners with the consumption of a supermarket, bring the two together, and suddenly we have a local relationship, a local business model, a local transaction. And of course, for supermarkets, it's very interesting because they can engage with, um, yeah, with their customers. Um, in the city, they can even start thinking about loyalty tokens or kind of other tokens. And um, so, yeah, that's pretty huge in retail um, to have a local value proposition and to engage with local customers. Yeah, not to mention that energy that's being produced locally, there's less, uh, there's less uh, loss uh, than energy that is being produced further away. So you, you also can, I think I read somewhere that five or six percent of all of the energy in the, sort of the U.S. grid was being lost. Uh, simply uh, over long distances. Now, one, one thing that you mentioned there that was, was really interesting was this idea of loyalty point systems and incentivizing. Um, th this is actually one of the uh, one of the objectives of this uh, this project that um, the, my company Stratum is, is working on with uh, Bougie Mobilier in Lyon is is incentivizing inhabitants of an eco neighborhood uh, to use green energy by then providing them, you know, re rewarding them with these uh, sort of fidelity points that they'll be able to use in local businesses and this type of thing. So we can already start to see sort of the new business models emerging and uh, incentive models emerging. And not necessarily from like the state or government actors, but from, uh, in this case, a real estate promoter. So um, that's, this is what we also see. We do a lot of customer insights. We talk to local businesses and they're a little bit bored when we start, when we of course start talking about blockchain, new energy contracts. But when we mention the term um, uh, local relationships and local loyalty points, uh, local proposition, then they immediately, um, yeah, then they immediately wake up and they really like to start engaging with us on these kind of propositions. Cool. Well, uh, Carson, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for sharing a bit about uh, what you're up to, what's going on with energy, blockchain, and, and some of the exciting projects that are happening on this side. Actually, we, we were talking about it before, Sebastian and I. I think you were the first person 
uh, that's been on the show, that's kind of, you know, working for an uh, old school, uh, old school, more or less, uh, company. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. And you two guys are real, real heroes for me because when I started listening to the first podcast, you really inspired me to look into further use cases. Cool. Well, thanks so much for that. Thank you. So yeah, we're going to look forward to, to what's coming with uh, with Carson and, and their innovation. Actually, they had, there's a nice video uh, of a Block Charge, which is their electric vehicle um, project, which we're going to link to in the show notes if people want to check that out. And yeah, thanks much for the listener for, you know, once again tuning in. Uh, we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network, so you can find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And if you want to support the show, then please leave us an iTunes review. It helps new people find the show. Uh, thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week.